Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the delayed uh, but very exciting first session of the SVC speaker series for September. We're really in for a treat today. Our um, speaker today is Professor Mukesh Patel of Rutgers University. Mukesh is a serial entrepreneur and advisor with experience in investment, innovation, business law, and education. He's founded numerous ventures, secured significant capital, and has worked with more than 100 investor partners. He's been featured in national media, and entrepreneur.com named him one of the hot 30 movers and shakers of New York City's startup scene. Mukesh is the founder and CEO of Juice Tank, New Jersey's largest co-working space and incubator for tech startups, and VX, an innovative venture accelerator that provides consulting to companies in the areas of innovation, creativity, corporate culture, employee engagement, new product development, business models, entrepreneurship, power networking, and strategic leadership, in case you, th you don't think he knows enough. <laughs> As an award-winning assistant professor of professional practice at Rutgers Business School, he teaches strategy and has designed a groundbreaking experiential and interdisciplinary course entitled ICE, standing for Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship. He is lead faculty for executive education where he designed and teaches innovation for corporate enterprise to corporate executives and managers. Mukesh is also the Director of Development and Co-Ad Professor for the Entrepreneurship Law Clinic at Rutgers Law School, providing valuable legal resources to the business community through a collaborative platform. And he also teaches women in business at the Global Village. You can stop right there. That's, fine. that's enough? Yeah, that's yeah. Good. Yeah. There's so it. much more. Yeah, oh, right. but you're going to talk about yourself? Nope. Okay, well, he's also spoken at TEDx, Google Campus, mm -hmm. and Seoul. Uh, spon uh, was at a conference sponsored by the U.S. Embassy. I mean, he's been all over. So we're very, very lucky to have Mukesh with us today. I was only halfway through everything he's done. <laughs> How are you guys so doing? So welcome. Thank welcome. you. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I apologize again for the delay. Um, we'll make this extra special. So just by um, raise of hands, how many of you are computer science slash computer engineers? OK. Um, other forms of engineering? OK. Uh, business? OK. How many of you own startups? OK. How many of you are in the process of trying to raise funding? OK. So trying to get a sense of how I can modify this dynamically to basically uh, take it in a direction that you guys may want to. So um, even though it's a deck, feel free to interrupt me so that I can actually forward through some things and uh, get to what you may want to talk about. So the primary um, objective here is that converging the three spheres of innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Like, where do they converge? How can you accelerate your uh, ideas to commercialization? How do you apply this even if you're not looking to do a startup? How do you apply it in the corporate world, perhaps, to accelerate your trajectory for leadership or opportunities? So people basically say it all starts with the idea. Agree? Agree. Yeah, OK. For the most part, yes. However, there's something way more critical than the idea. And so it really starts with this. It starts with, first, a commitment, and a commitment based on hunger and drive. Uh, or commitment for technology to work, yeah. Uh, hunger and drive. And then you basically feel that with your interest and passion. Um, now, this is not absolutely necessary because if you've got the hunger and drive to just execute and you're an executioner, you will get it done. But if you're looking for the long game, then that will go quite far. Then you need this, MST. You need the right mindset, the right skill sets on your team if you don't have them and the right tool sets? Do you have the right resources? And then you converge them. It can go far. And here's a model of like, OK, how long does it take to take an idea and actually bring it to the market and do it well and scale? And is there a model for that? And so this is something I've created called the IQ model. Basically, 
in about 100 days. There's 100 steps in 100 days. Now, while I won't go through each and every step, I've categorized them in buckets so that it's easier to kind of visualize them, see them, understand the frameworks. So you first identify, hopefully it's a pain point or a problem or an unmet need, but it doesn't have to exclusively be that. Some people will actually come up with great ideas that are not based on an actual need, but are based on some sort of desire. Sometimes it's an unknown desire, meaning your customers don't even know that they want what you're about to sell them or give them. So it's identifying potentially a pain problem or an unmet need or a desire. Then you go straight into customer discovery, which is really trying to figure out what the customer is thinking, what their experience is with the current available um, products and services or competitive set, what they might be willing to pay for, whatever it is that you're trying to sell them, and you start building your team immediately. The next step after that, you go into the invention part. And for that component, you're going to look at ideation, conceptualization, prototype, and pilots, and then start developing your business model, your deck, your pitch, also known as the pitch deck, if you're going to pitch it, and your executive summary. Typically a one-pager, no more than two pages. You do that, and then you start implementing after two months, and you start now formalizing your strategy, whatever funds you need to get launched and get started, potentially a lean business plan, which at some point you might need, but not the traditional business plan, the 30, 40 pager. We're talking about five to 10 pages, really more than enough. Um, you're gonna continue to enhance your team. That will continue forever. One takeaway is that don't overemphasize the skill sets and underemphasize the mindsets, because that can go a long way. If you've got the right team with the right mindsets, you can crush it. Another component is, even if you have a great idea, you need to differentiate between an idea versus a product or service versus a great business, a great company. These are three completely different challenges that require a unique set of skills and resources and mindsets. You could have the best product in the world, but it doesn't mean it, there'll be a demand and or you'll be able to commercialize or create revenues and profitability or scale. You can have a great, you know, you can have a great idea with a great product. It still doesn't mean you've got a great company. Even if you have a company, differentiate that to go from zero to let's say 1 million in revenue is very different than one to 10, 10 to 25, 25 to 50, 75 or 100, and 100 to 250, 250 to 500 to a billion. Very different. And so it could be the same person that came up with the idea that leads it to a billion valuation, like in many of the unicorn cases that you may already be familiar with. But quite often, more often than not, it's somebody replacing the senior leadership at those stages, mm -hmm. which basically means those that know how to take a company from, let's say, 100 million to a billion, probably fail really fast if you tell them we're at a $1 million stage, grow from here, or we're at zero. So just the, because they know how to go from 50 to 100 does not mean they can go from zero to 1 million. And so these are different types of uh, acumen experiences and kind of uh, patience and all of that, those things. Some people who kind of succeeded in the large corporate industry, unless you give them a significant budget and resources, they really don't know where to go from there. Um, okay, so then we go back to, does it really begin with an idea perhaps, but it, more likely not. It's really about making the idea happen, even in its imperfect stage, even in uncertain times and without perfect information. So this is a framework that's used by lots of companies, um, including Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, and his team, Charlie Munger, use this. Es essentially, can you have a team of expert generalists? Which means that each person can go deep in one, two, or three disciplines, but they're also pretty good at being a generalist, so they can identify opportunities, connect the dots across disciplines, and help fortify your interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary perspective. Um, so that means you could be an engineer, but if you have an opportunity to learn how finance works in the company, learn that. Learn marketing, learn strategy, learn ops, learn, you know, and even if you're not an engineer, 
learn as much as you can across disciplines, across industries, that'll help build the peripheral vision for opportunities. So Davos, you familiar with Davos? World Economic Forum, they meet once a year, typically in Switzerland, Davos, and it's uh, the world's experts in economic development and prosperity and things along those lines. So last year, um, they interviewed about six or 7,000 CEOs and said, what are the top kind of criteria that or skills that are absolutely required for the next generation of companies to launch, grow, thrive, scale? Creativity and innovation was at the top. And, and those are really two distinct things, not necessarily the same. They, they lump them together. But I like to think of them as pretty distinct that have some overlap. Um, most educational institutions don't necessarily focus on helping you build your creativity and innovation skill sets. Um, they really focus on the traditional kind of, here's the book, here's the knowledge base, memorize it, apply it perhaps in some limited fashion, regurgitate it on some exam, typically multiple choice and or essay, and then basically you keep moving on. But when you think about it in the real world, how often do companies assess by giving a written multiple choice or true false or essay exam? Probably doesn't happen. So there are much better ways to assess your team and, and folks you know, as you grow, as opposed to like what, what education has for the last 100 years kind of given us. Then you look at things like leadership. So for engineers, this is a phenomenal time that if engineers can build the leadership and business acumen, and some emotional intelligence and all the other things that go with it. S something new called AQ, adaptability quotient, um, you know, IQ, EQ. These are probably more, all more important than IQ in itself uh, these days. And so if you can learn to, someone with an engineering background, learning business and personal you know, uh, human dynamics um, can go tremendously far. Um, not to say that if you don't have that background, you can't, but you then need to kind of partner up with someone who maybe has those skills. Adaptability, probably one of the um, most understated requirement because people are always looking for the right answer. But adaptability is everything goes wrong. Um, competitors kind of throw your business plan out the window the day you declare it, and et cetera. And then problem solving, which is traditional academia, is kind of last on this list. So there's a company called Idea Lab. Uh, they're, they're based in the Bay Area in, in, uh, near San Francisco, um, founded in 96, so not too long ago. They've created way more than 150 companies by now, uh, probably had over 150 IPOs and acquisitions. So they did this study to find out what are the top five drivers for success. And there's a TED Talk behind this as well, if, if you've seen it. Um, so they looked at lots of companies and basically, this is what they found. Timing. Are you too early or too late to that particular idea space um, for competitive advantage? If you're too late, but you're number two or three or four, maybe even top five, you can still make a go and do really well. And you've seen cases like that all the way from Google not being the first search engine to you know, others. Uh, but if you're too early, you have to kind of wait until technology or other components are ready and kind of primed for you to take advantage of that. How do you assess timing? Really hard to assess. It's, it's, I would think it's more of like a retrospect thing where, oh, the timing wasn't right. But have you well, it's easier, of course, in, retro, in hindsight to say, were we too early or were too late? But you can start assessing it by talking to those that are far ahead in tangential spaces and say, the, what do you think about the concept of these technologies or innovations kind of almost being there in place, and here's my business model, what do you think? Do I need to wait, or do you think I can be the first to market, potentially, or, or take uh, extra market share from that? So the more feedback you get from those that are really deep in that expert generalist in those spaces or spheres will give you that sense of if you're too early or too late. Um, VCs, in general, are getting better and better at identifying this timing thing. So they're taking more risk. So yeah, if you get feedback from enough VCs that, are, um, that understand technology and innovation, they should be able to give you some indication of this is great timing. 
and you know, or look, you've, uh, there's already 10 players ahead of you. You don't have much differentiation, so pivot or, or do something else. Then comes the idea followed by the business model. I actually think they should be reversed, in my opinion. I think the business model is the core, and then the idea could pivot and will change as you develop. So really get this right. Um, they're fairly close, but I would say like focus on the business model. That's so important. Um, and then lastly, funding. Now, where does funding really make a difference? Not so much early stage. Funding makes a huge difference during growth. Like you've already proved, proven the traction. Now you need significant capital for your growth strategy. But guess what? You've minimized the risks by that point, right? Because you now have customers, you've got revenue, you've got a team. So that growth part is actually a, a whole nother uh, game that's a lot more fun to play because you can move fairly fast and you've got a team to get you there and you'll get funding because you have traction. So let's briefly just talk about timing. Um, and there's two elements of timing, the pace and then trends and opportunities through the lens of innovation. So when we talk about pace, um, everyone talks about like change. But we're way past change. This is, like, this is not the time of change anymore. This is what I call the fourth magnitude of change is where we're at today. We are accelerated exponential disruptive change. And there's no going back, not in the foreseeable future. So it is no longer just change. People say, oh, some people are afraid of change. Forget that. You've got to be comfortable with this today. In terms of trends and opportunities, there's about 20 trends and opportunities that are happening today that if you just pick a few of them, you can kind of potentially ride that wave. And so you just have to be on top of what's happening in the space of investments. Who's investing in what, when, how much? And that'll give you a good sense. I'm not going to cover all 20, but I do want to highlight about maybe five or six really fast ones. The one is high performance computing, HPC, supercomputers. And if you look at terms where we are, we're right before the edge of this kind of, think of optical quantum DNA computing, right in that space. And this curve basically is a flat curve. It accelerates, and we're at the inflection point um, in terms of that. Because you've got everything from uh, you know, the Google quantum computer. Many universities have these high performance computers. And you've heard of Moore's law. So a lot of technologists will say, well, how long can Moore's law apply? And so if you ask for the uh, theorists and the thought leaders, they'll say the fundamental, fundamental platforms of Moore's law will change and will basically allow Moore's law to continue indefinitely. That's pretty scary that they can actually go indefinitely because the, the platforms will change in, in themselves. Um, then you look at broadband connectivity. So in the next two to three years, we're looking at more than two billion new people coming onto the internet for the first time globally. And you've got lots of companies building these technologies, Airborne, for example, an entire mini satellite network attached to commercial airlines. Um, IOTs, pretty much everyone's going to be familiar with IOTs, but just look at the magnitude of that curve going from anywhere from, let's say, 10 billion devices today to in two, two and a half years, more than 50 billion devices that are connected with data uh, feeding through that. So if you plot that curve, that curve is drastic. And it looks just like the human uh, high performance computing curve, very similar to that. Every industry, pretty much, has, is being subjected to this um, IoT curve, as you will, whether it's healthcare, consumer products, utilities, uh, automotive, homes, real estate, et cetera. The next one is data. And so unless you're a data science, it's hard to really wrap this sometimes um, in, in your business model. But Domo is a company that kind of tracks data in a pretty interesting way. This is already one year old. What happens every 60 seconds? So if you just look at some of these numbers, it's, we've already exceeded that. These numbers are already old numbers. Every 60 seconds. And how much data? Well, same curve. It's flat for many, many, many generations, starts picking up steam, and we're at this inflection point, 2019. Now data is measured not in 
gigabytes or terabytes or any of those things, typically measured in zettabytes, right? Um, which is 1,000 to the seventh power is one zettabyte. So when you look at that, you can say, OK, in the past two years, more data was created than all of humankind, essentially. And that pace should just keep picking up. So by 2020 again, 44 trillion gigabytes or 44 zettabytes. The opportunity is that less than 1% is actually being analyzed and commercialized or things like that. Open source. Um, you guys are familiar with this, so I won't go into this, but you look at like what Tesla has done with open source of certain IP and how it's changing the entire industry. Even though they're going through kind of a roller coaster and lots of um, behavior that I would not, you know, perhaps uh, um, support, but still, like in terms of what they've done for the industry and other industries uh, there, like Volvo, basically every car will be a you know, fully electric car starting 2020 or 2021, um, perhaps even sooner. Volkswagen is also going there, Mercedes, BMW, they're all basically doing their paradigm shift. It would not have happened had something like Tesla not kind of come out there and pushed everyone to those limits. What about like technology and workplace and kind of human behavior? So typically real estate doesn't change until every 40 year cycles, but then workspace changes every 10 years, the workforce every eight, organizational changes every three. The first one is Moore's Law, right? Every approximately 15, 18 months. Uh, so when you look at, my interest is also looking at this part right here, workforce organizational change, massive, massive change. More than 40% of the US workforce will be contingent workers by 2020. That's never happened before. These are all part of these kind of changing trends at a very fast pace, and it continues to accelerate. It's somebody who has you know, a gig thing going on on the side, essentially. You look at autonomous vehicles, we talked about that. Um, genetic engineering. So here's Moore's Law versus the cost for a genetic edit. So 2001, 18 years ago, 17 years ago, $100 million cost. In 2008, we break that sound barrier, essentially, and it comes down um, to about 10 million. Then you're at about 1 million today you're really under $1,000. Some companies even under $600, $500. Airspace, aerospace. Uh, traditionally, it was only governments and companies like NASA that can actually do this. Now you've got four companies, none of whom are trained rocket scientists. Maybe one, potentially, self-taught. Um, but the others, just the wealth is kind of changing the paradigm of aerospace to the point where now the government and NASA is giving them billions of dollars to actually um, change that frontier. Population. So if you look at population, it's increasing, but at a different rate now. And that's the, um, the acceleration curve. So it took about 150,000 years to get to our first billion, then 123 years, 33, 14, 13, 12. We're now stabilizing at around a dozen years, adding a billion people. So literally between 2011 and 23, within five years from now, we cross over the 8 billion population. But it's slowing down. So a lot of countries are thinking about, how, do we accelerate this or do we not? Crowdsourcing, including crowdfunding, both the non-equity kind and the equity kind that just came into law several years ago. Um, and you're familiar with some of the sites and resources there. 3D printing. Although this hasn't taken on so much in the consumer side, there's aerospace companies and car companies and others that are actually now doing quite a bit in 3D printing. This is a friend of mine who was at our uh, think tank and, at, at my uh, incubator and co-working space. Um, he's an architect from NJIT with a master's in architecture and design. And he partnered up with a Google engineer. And in one summer, they basically created this, Alaris. What Belarus does is you connect it to these leads, connect it to your heart, you know, um, onto your chest. And it's basically a commercial EKG machine, just like in hospitals. But instead of costing fifty to $100,000, perhaps, this entire product 
was 3D printing in our printed in our office um, for under fifty dollars, minus some of the wires or electronic components, which are very cheap. And it actually works, which is quite quite remarkable. Um, then you think about kind of globalization, and we can talk about this quite a bit, but I, I'm just touching upon that if you're connected to these spheres, you can learn a lot about like what's happening in terms of who's behind the US or who's at par or perhaps a little ahead and use that to your advantage. Because great idea that's already been tested here and working, that by the time that company gets to other markets, it's not too difficult for someone else to just replicate that, get ahead of that curve, thrive, and then basically what happens? What happens after that? Lawsuit. No, not lawsuit. <laughs> Strike that. Lawsuit if there's a violation of some IP. But assuming that <clears throat> there's no violation of IP, someone's just looking at your model and saying, oh, that can be recreated, reinvented, or workaround, or it's not even IP. It's just a business model. What happens? Yes, acquisition at really high numbers. Because by the time they replicate that and get their foothold, forget that. Just pay a billion dollars and buy them out. Right? Happens all the time. And you're seeing that happening. And, and so therefore, the unicorns, traditionally a myth. But now if you actually look at how many unicorns are coming out, many of them started by young you know, 25-year-olds partnering up with some people with experience. Um, quite remarkable. So I'm so fascinated. How does someone who doesn't have experience in a particular space get to build a startup that gets, in 10 years, valued at more than a billion dollars. I'm just fascinated with that concept in itself. Um, and so looking at, you know, let's say 250 to 300 unicorns, most are still from the US, but other countries are quickly catching on. Um, AI, machine learning, you just put these into your business model, and perhaps there's a whole slew of investors that now may take a look and see what you're doing. Of course, you'll have to prove that it applies and it's viable and, and, and material. Two, teams, execution. So when people say, who's on my team, you got to think 10 levels. Your team has to consist of all these parties. And that's how you can build a team. So it's no longer just co-founders or my employees. You really have to think about who are my consultants or contractors, board of advisors, versus board of directors. Do you know the distinction? Board of advisors versus board of directors? Yes? No? Anyone want to take a guess? Board of advisors probably uh, uh, get either paid as consultants or part of the action. Board of directors have responsibility uh, for the uh, for the fiduciary responsibility of the company. Yes. So. Uh, and let me extrapolate that even further. Absolutely correct. Board of directors have a vote. So they can basically influence the, your direct, the direction of your company, including who the top officers are. Let's call it the C-suite for now. Um, and because they have that vote or management say at, that, at the board level, what do they in return get that is paired with that? Stop. Well. Potentially stock, but I'm talking about uh, on the worst side. Liability. 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 They have exposure to liability. So therefore, you have to have that E&O insurance and all that kind of stuff. Board of advisors have no vote. They have no management say. They are there to serve you as the founder or C-suite executives. And so because of that, they could get stock, which many of them do, but they have no vote. They're there to really be your confident, trusted advisors. And there's no exposure to liability. right? Um, then you got to think about opportunities. There's four opportunities with respect to your team. There's how do you recruit them and cast that wide net for the perfect person you're looking for. Then your hiring and onboarding process. Is it unique? Is it differentiated? Is there an experience that underlies it? Of course, developing them, giving them autonomy, not telling them how to do something, but telling them, What's your vision, mission, core values, and objectives, both strategic and financial objectives, and letting them tell you how to get there. See, if you're hiring the smartest people and you're telling them how to do it, that's, you're wasting the asset. 
they should be telling you how they would like to do it, and you should be supporting them to experiment or try. So autonomy and mastery, retaining, because they could leave. There's you know 70 percent of corporate employ uh, 70 to 80 plus percent of corporate employees in this country, probably globally, are either disengaged or actively disengaged from work. And so why did they leave? Typically because they're manager. It's not even about the company. So you have to make sure that whoever you're developing into that management role, that you're observing how effective they are in, in supporting everyone else. So take the traditional kind of pyramid of corporate structure. There's a book that a friend of mine wrote called Flip the Pyramid. Pretty fascinating book. Basically, it should be like this, and you should be at the bottom. Your objective is to support everyone else's success. What can you do to help them, right? And, and so there's lots of models you can use for incentive and et cetera. How many co-founders should you have? So ideally, being a solopreneur is really, really tough. It's not impossible, but your chance of raising capital go down significantly. So ideally, two to four, more than four is really hard to manage. Still doable, but again, the probabilities start changing. If you can only have two, think of one makes the thing and one sells the thing, <laughs> right? Because making it is not sufficient. Again, think of Segway, right? Great engineering marvel, but not so commercially successful. So one makes it, one sells it. Now, if you can have three, then you add this kind of operations or d domain expert in the middle, push sales, marketing, biz dev to this side, technology, innovation to that side. And then you basically underpin it with advisory board and then professional representatives. Having the right law firm, the right accounting firm, and the right advisors is like night and day in terms of your potential. If you get the wrong law firm, the wrong accounting firm, you will pay for that. So make sure you vet them. You ask lots of successful founders. Who did they use initially? Would they use them again or not? Who did they use then? Remember, every stage, they may be shifting those selections. If you're looking for co-founders, yes, you want complementary kind of skills because you want that diversity and like strengthen your weakness and all that. You want perspective diversification. They should have a different contact base. So here's the problem. Most people, if you actually did a, um, a radius map of where the co-founders come from, they mostly come from the same like four walls, the campus, the town, the city, et cetera. That's not that great. Um, you should diversify even more. Because everyone, like for example, here, probably has a similar sense of thinking, similar way of thinking. If you find someone from Boston, someone from New York, someone from California, someone from overseas, they will bring tremendously different perspectives and mindsets and skill sets and connections to go with that. Of course, all of these are pretty intuitive, but, but people forget to like assess people on personalities, passion, grit, comparable values. And then, do your co-founders have the ability to keep funding at your pace? If not, you have to have provisions that say, if you don't fund it and there's a capital call, this, will, this dilution mechanism will kick in. So that's important. Um, where do you find co-founders or anybody on your team? These are some places you can look. Conferences, meetups are huge. Incubators, accelerators throughout the world, not just here. Um, power connectors, find out who they are. And basically find three or four power connectors. You can get to almost anyone. Uh, there are agencies that can help you. And of course, my favorite, anywhere, everywhere. Like if you're, I met some of the most craziest co-founders, like craziest in a positive way, um, co-founders at random places in the elevator in New York City. Just started a conversation. Ended up, he was a PhD from Bell Labs, about to retire, wanted to license his technology out, start a company, was looking for a couple of co-founders. We hit it off, launched that company. And so you can meet people. I met people on an airplane. Um, sometimes by just like going back to where like all the uh, air crew like hang out in the kitchen in the back sometimes. Just go there and start a conversation. You never know who they're married to or who they are, uh, or whose connection, you know, what connections they have, because they're pretty globally connected. Um, so you can meet people pretty interesting. Equity allocation. 
Many sophisticated investors recommend that you don't just do a blind equal split of your equity amongst the co-founders. Why? Because that's the easiest thing to do. It requires no thought, no debate, no considerations of all the factors and variables that can make a difference for being fair and equitable. So I would say just to like appeal to them at least, like change it up a little bit and consider lots of other factors such as these, right? Who's committing how much capital, who's providing leadership, full-time, part-time, um, who provided the idea or prototype, who's gonna build a team, et cetera. The way you wanna do it with all employees and all co-founders, even advisors, is come up with like some sort of restricted stock, a vesting schedule. So for co-founders and, and employees, four-year vesting is the, the standard in the industry. These are not absolute like um, etched in stone, but these are best practices. Um, initial cliff, six to nine months. You can make it shorter or longer. Are you all familiar with cliffs? Probably not. Probably not. So in, in its simplest form, an initial cliff is like your um, honeymoon or dating period. Basically, they, nothing vests during that period. You're testing them out. If you believe that they're the right person, good fit, then after the cliff, if you keep them, their vesting starts. Perhaps it catches up also, it could have an accelerated provision, but it starts. If you terminate them during the cliff period, they get nothing. That's the risk they take. If you terminate them after the cliff period, they earn the vesting. So depending on when you terminate them, they only vest up to that period of time and not anything past that, right? You can do monthly vesting or quarterly vesting or semi-annual or annual vesting. Annual, too long. Monthly, sometimes too much paperwork. So somewhere between monthly and quarterly is probably the best practice. And then, I'm not gonna go into this, but you should absolutely know what an 83B tax election is and talk to your lawyers and accountants. If they don't raise that with you, you should fire them. End of story. Um, again, with advisors, it's not four years. It's typically two years. With co-founders and employees, typically four years. 10 to 20% will be your employee pool. The first 10% can probably cover the first 10 to 20 people. Um, and then you can go from there. Make sure that if you have anyone who's not an employee or co-founder um, helping you develop anything, I don't care what kind of IP it is. It could be a trademark, a copyright, a design, a website, code, um, technology, whatever it is, uh, even marketing collateral, have this agreement with them called work made for hire agreement. If you don't do that and it doesn't fall into certain classifications, they basically, even if you paid them, they own the IP. So you wanna make sure that's the one document that you should absolutely have with anyone that you kind of outsource anything in. If they're employees, you'll have an employment agreement which will have similar provisions already in there and co-founders will have similar provisions. Um, oh, people always say, what about NDAs? I used to believe in NDAs and used to use them. Today, I don't use them anymore. Not until like much further discussions where they wanna see the proprietary information. So, because the savviest investors will basically put you in the bucket of being unsavvy as an entrepreneur if you ask for an NDA. They, because they can't. They see two, 3,000 pitches a year. You think they actually catalog and keep track of dates and meetings and who they discuss what with whom? No way. Incubators, accelerators, co-working spaces do not sign NDAs for the same reason. The top-notch advisory board members do not sign NDAs. So just be savvy about that. Do your homework before you actually ask for one or wait until you're actually revealing your proprietary information, which should not be until they've actually committed and checked you out, did their diligence, like your team, like the idea, like the business model, before you get into any details. Into the thing. So you basically stage your conversations. Hey, quick question. Yep. So what is the difference between the events and assignment agreement and the work for hire agreement? Um, so they're similar. Um, work, the invention assignment agreement typically is also used for employees, um, whereas a work made for hire agreement is not used for employees. It's used for like third parties, independent consultants, et cetera. But s some of the intention and the provisions are similar. Um, you can also look at certain sites like Co-Founders Lab to find people or Trinet, which is a local company 
um, has something called Startup Central, which has some great resources, or Payscale has some good HR resources, same as Robert Half. Um, all right, strategic partnerships. It can help you to do a JV, a joint venture, an alliance. It can help you in these things. So if you need this advantage, um, like reducing your time to market or to scale, or access to certain customers that they might have that you don't, or vice versa, or access to technology or talent or branding credibility. You, the, this is a great way that so many companies kind of ride that wave. Advisory boards. When, it's not if, you should have one. The question is when. I recommend um, you should have one the day you launch, like day one. The day you commit to launch, you should have an advisory board. Why? Think about it. You're only giving them such small equity that's vesting over two years, but you're getting world-class advisors helping you along that way. It's worth collectively um, giving a few percentage points for that. Like, absolutely worth it. What's the framework? Yes? Yes. Do you mean when you launch the product or when you launch your company? Either or the first to happen or when you just commit to, like, starting. So I build my advisory board before I even build the product before I even form a company, like way before any of that. The moment I have an idea and I'm committed to it, I start building my advisory board. Now, you go from mentors to someone on your advisory board. Yeah. Is, it, is it an equity offer and you sign in a, a That's, agreement? Yes. Now they're officially on your board. That's correct. So the way to think about it is you can start with mentors first. Mentors is kind of a loose term, very important, but kind of a loose term. And so if they don't have like a vested interest, you're not like making it uh, a firm um, kind of mutually reciprocal model. Mentors will kind of do it at their pace. They don't have this kind of fiduciary duty of anything, right? It's like you meet them, you talk to them, they give you feedback, et cetera. At some point, either a mentor can turn into an advisory board or you can just start from scratch and say, okay, now I'm looking for advisory board and maybe some mentors can apply, et cetera. And you should have a formal advisory board agreement. Simple two-pager document, good enough. That basically has some basic stuff. How many? I say start with about two or three, and then put your advisors to work for you. Delegate them the task of filling out the rest of your advisory board over time. You still have the say. You still make decisions. And, uh, but let them do that work. That's what they're good for. They have that network, right? You can, of course, suggest people and, and appoint people as well. And then you grow it to somewhere between five to nine, let's say within two years approximately. Um, think about maybe two types of advisory boards, a technical and a business advisory board, or at least make sure that they're not all in one or the other bucket, kind of diversify there. But then also diversify across every one of these verticals. So expertise, what I typically do, the model I like is that about a third of your advisors can be domain experts, a third or less. The rest are going to be people who've been there, done that. Uh, technologists, engineers, entrepreneurs, or technology entrepreneurs. And then a third, functional experts. Strategy, marketing, operations, manufacturing, distribution, whatever it is that you need. Also diversified by gender. There's now ample um, research that basically says that Women on boards, those companies actually are more profitable than boards without women. And it's a sad state when less than 20% of companies' boards uh, or senior management consist of women. And in the VC world, venture-funded companies, it's like under 5% occasionally. So very sad. You should um, absolutely uh, Make sure that you have a diversified board. Geography, we talked about that. Pe people in different regions think differently. They have very different mindsets, different networks, different ways of uh, solving problems. Age, okay. Most people gravitate towards people that are within their age group or slightly older. But make sure you have somebody that's been there, done it many, many times over, that's perhaps retired, like one person from that perspective because they have tremendous networks and credibility, but also put like a college student on your advisory board because they will think of things that no expert will ever think about, right? Because think about what happens as we get older and more experienced. Our vision kind of gets very laser, 
like. We lose the generalist component and we become kind of been there, done that, status quo, compliant, complacent, etc. And our peripheral vision kind of goes. So you want to make sure that it's not someone who becomes like an expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. Like it doesn't even matter anymore. It's the old way of doing things. So get somebody young on there as well. Another, another yep. Sure. So for advisors, for world class top tier advisors, what's yep. the highest you would recommend in terms of uh, like equity compensation? Okay, so there's no magic number, but I've seen up to like two percent. Yep. And uh, okay. I've got I've gotten that on an occasion, um, just based on synergy and the type. You know, more than two percent, you probably don't need to do it unless they're part-time working for you. Like actually taking like product development and running that or taking business development and running that. If they're running like a division, totally different. Right? Invest, would there to to your investing. Yeah. Um, with advisors, it depends. The better the advisor and if they say, look, uh, I've already given you some time and et cetera, then maybe no cliff. But you know, depending on the spectrum and your uh, influence or negotiating uh, leverage, you can you can talk about that as well. Do they meet advisors meet as a board? It seemed to imply that there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one with advisors. It can be one-on-one, -on -one, but be careful not to take up so much of their time one-on-one. -on -one. It's better to like hold initially like um, bi-monthly calls, uh, like every two weeks until until you just get kicked off. And the moment you get kicked off, turn it into like monthly. And then at some point, quarterly, right? So you want to transition towards that and use their time like very judiciously, basically. Um, and a week before your call, you have to send out a memo to your advisory board. Because you do, if you get a 30-minute call, that 30-minute call should be so efficient, you should not be talking about anything that you could have told them in a memo before the call. So if it's like, oh, this is what happened in the last 30 days, these are our milestones. These are some of our challenges. Here's who we had meetings with. This was discussed. Put that in a memo. Done. Put confidential on the top for advisory board, you know, advisory board only. Send it to them. So this way, your call is not about you talking. Your call should be about your advisors talking to you and you asking questions about where you need help or the connections you need. I'm not going to go too deep into this. Just know the difference between restricted stock awards versus stock options. 83B plays um, a role here, and they have that very different tax consequences. All right, uh, I learned this in California. Uh, I met the CEO of LinkedIn, and he basically drew out a version of this that I thought was pretty interesting, and they use that to recruit and develop. So the way to think about it is um, assess every one of your teammates, and we talked about 10 layers of teammates through this kind of lens, set of lenses. Where's their passion, right? That's one. Like, are they super excited when you talk to them? Do their eyes light up? Do you see the hunger in their, in their belly? But then, where's their like superpower skill? Like, what are they really, really amazingly talented at, right? And then do they converge with where the opportunity is? Like, where they'll be rewarded, your company will be rewarded uh, for that opportunity. And you have to triangulate this. If you get this right, you'll be recruiting the right people one after another at scale. You get this wrong and any one piece misses. So let me give you an example. They've got passion and opportunity but no talent. That's like um, dreaming. It's like the person who wants to be an actor or a singer and just can't sing or act. Right? They've got, they're passionate. And there's opportunities. There's lots of casting calls and auditions. But it won't work. They have to recognize the weakness, turn it into a strength, or pick a different space. If you've got passion and talent but no opportunity, you're happy but poor. Super passionate, you've got the skills, loving it every day, but you're not making any money. You've got talent and opportunity but no passion. Um, you're basically um, bored. Always looking at the clock. When's my time to get out of here? Right? Uh, you're, you're rich, but bored. People are paying you. Uh, at one point in my life, I was at that place where, you know, it's like, how much do you want to make? It doesn't mean anything. Like, there's no purpose or meaning in that. Right? On an hourly basis, you look at the numbers and you're like, wow, 
people are actually paying this, but it doesn't matter. Like, you're just bored. Huh. The idea or product. Just think agile, lean, simple. Like, live by that methodology very quickly. You want to rapidly and iteratively build your hypothesis and test your assumptions, get customer feedback, refine, have metrics. In terms of design, I like this by uh, Dieter Rams, the 10 principles of good design, including this last one. Good design is as little design as possible. Why? Because you're, not, you're throwing away the non-essentials, essentially. If you stick to the essentials, don't complicate your product or service. Not in the beginning. Gain some traction. Engineers have been built to have the mindset that, OK, oh, we're not ready yet. OK, we're going to market. Nope, we're not ready. It needs to be better. Nope, it needs to be perfect. I have to get it all right. That, what happens, in, with think of IP at universities or in companies. There's a whole vault of IP that's just collecting dust because they don't commercialize. They don't get to the market. Um, storytelling, really, really important. If you're not good at this, get an amazing storyteller to help you create your deck. There's lots of software packages out there that'll help you like create frameworks and wireframing or design if you don't know how to do this, but like um, get someone to help you. All right, very important. Business model, it's called the TPM model. We run a, a course called Collaborative for Technology, Entrepreneurship, and Commercialization at Rutgers between the engineering school and the business school. And this is so important. What does this mean? Most technologists or engineers focus so much on the technology that they just can't get to the next step. Technology, just think about it. Don't get lost in the science. Think of what are the capabilities? What is that thing capable of doing? And you basically list some use cases in plain English. I have seen pitches from like people who are in life science or aerospace or engineering, uh, electrical, mechanical. And all the investors, who are, many of them may not be tech savvy um, or not engineers, it's just over their head. Like it's not a compelling pitch. Put it down in plain English. What are the capabilities? Then think about product ideas. What are the use cases for that capability? And you can come up with several of them. And for each product idea or service idea, have somewhere between one to three value propositions. And for every single value proposition, have one to three customer segments. No more than that. If you have more than three customer segments for any single value proposition, or you have more than three value propositions, it's way too much to handle as a startup company. That's how you can design your TPM. And then product to market, if you get that fit right through the other things we talked about, you're way ahead in terms of that competitive landscape. If you have an out of business model canvas, just search it. It's got what, nine boxes. You don't go in order. You go from pro value proposition to customer segmentation to channels to relationship. You kind of follow this path. This slide is on. You'll find it out there. When you're thinking about the customer journey map, think about first you're going to go through discovery and validation, and this is the search process. Then you go into execution, which is generate your customers, and then are you retaining them? So many people start losing customers as they grow, and they just neglect that. And then there's going to be lots of pivots through that process, but a simple framework for customer journey mapping. Also, when you think of your customer, you should have this lens on. There's six attributes to customers. Because your customer may be a user, but not a recommender. Maybe a decision maker, but not the economic buyer. There also may be someone who stands as your hurdle, or a saboteur, as they call them, who's going to basically knock you down so their company doesn't have to deal with you because they think it's too risky. So you want to make sure that everyone you talk to from a customer point of view identify which categories, because it'll be very important to flesh this out in your business model. If you haven't studied design thinking, um, the design school at Stanford basically put this on the map. And uh, they run programs on design thinking. Lots of universities now have courses in design thinking. But IDEO is probably one of the best in terms of design thinking in a weekend. Pretty expensive, 
but amazing. You go through these six steps in iterative, fast um, kind of implementation process. So you, you can, there's a lot of information on Stanford's website. If you just go to dschoolstanford.edu, you'll see how each of these plays a role in using design thinking to scale, you know, grow and scale. I then, what I did is I took design thinking and put experience design, so five stages of any customer experience, and then map that against something called the observational research framework of activities, environment, interactions, objects, and users with an empathy map of user experience. How does your customer think? What are their emotions, actions, and communications? And then added a layer of front stage and backstage, which this means is what is visible is front stage, what you see and observe and hear and, and talk to. Backstage is the stuff that goes on in their head when you're not there. And so you have to capture both. And kind of if you grid your strategy on this for experience design, you can differentiate your company from lots of other people. Capital is basically only four types, equity, debt, grants, and crowdfunding, non-equity. Because equity crowdfunding is part of equity. Right? You don't want to take on debt until you're ready and for a growth stage. Typically, this is a sequence. You self-fund, bootstrap, and then you go to family and friends, customers, strategic partners, angels, VCs, et cetera. Um, there's 24 steps for the financing part. I won't go through all of them, but I'm going to tell you what the categories are. First, you prepare to launch. We talked about a lot of these things. The next kind of eight are build your company. Incorporate with the right type of entity. Basically, out of the nine different forms of entity, you should only be thinking about two, two and a half. It's maybe LLC, although most investors will not invest in LLCs. So at the right time, they will force you to convert from an LLC to a C corporation. Or it's a C corporation right from the beginning. Possibly, you can file something called a subchapter S status so you have single taxation. There are four criteria to satisfy the subchapter S. I won't go through them, but they're all online. Uh, your lawyers and accountants should be educating you on this. And then that's the process that you do about it. The best way to incorporate is to set up a Delaware C Corp. You don't have to convert. You don't have to convince anyone that you weren't savvy. You do it right the, for, from the get-go, and you scale. We <coughs> talked about a lot of these as well. And then when you're raising funds, start talking to investors when you don't need investment capital. Build that relationship over a year or more. Because when you're ready to pitch to them, they already know you. They will give you a meeting. How do you get to investors? They all have gatekeepers in, in some form or another. Lawyers, accountants, advisory board members, boards of directors, consultants are their gatekeepers. Know them, and you can get to the investors. Also, get to know their portfolio company founders. If you know them, and they recommend to their own investors that they ought to meet you, guess what? your probability of getting that meeting just skyrocketed. You need to diligence your investors as much as they diligence you. Only 2.5% raise angel capital. That's 1 out of 40. And 1 out of 400 gets VC funding. So it's not easy. But if you get it, you can be in the game and really grow. Um, we talked about this. Oh, if you're going to have a pitch, I recommend having like five versions of your pitch. And, and the pitch should match the deck also. So basically five decks. Like the 15 second, two slides, one sentence. The you know, half a minute to a minute, the three minute, the five minute, and then the 10 to 30 minute. Because at different points in time, depending on how much time they have, you'll have to pull the right deck out. You should also have one deck for investors and another one for maybe strategic partners or to recruit employees and advisors. So we come down to here. Did you notice it stops at 99 and not 100? Do you know what happens on the 100th day? You celebrate. <laughs> but you don't celebrate before then. Like, there'll be small milestones and wins. And yeah, you can do small celebrations. But really, it's when you get to that 100th day, that's when you, or you start hitting it, assuming that's your time frame. Right? If your time frame is one year, all this gets extrapolated out. Uh, you can have lots of setbacks. So your motto has to be, with every setback, you've got to come back. And so let me show you what I mean by that. Trivia, last 60 seconds. Can you name who this was? 
Disney. Can you imagine being the person that fires Walt for lack of imagination? Go figure. That's what experts do. That's how they think. Okay, so you don't stop. I would hate to be the one that rejects a Steven Spielberg from a film school. Like, can you imagine that? <laughs> Too emotionally invested in the stories and with her crowd. I put this one up because I just. I don't know what he's thinking when he's got that look. <laughs> and so I love, I love his. Uh... <laughs> Same thing for Home Depot. The founders of Home Depot were fired from like a hardware, you know, retail experience store. Because the founders or the owners said, you two like know nothing about this space. You're screwing things up. Your idea is really bad. Trust us, we've been in this business for generations. Fired them, and that same day, they wrote down the business plan for Home Depot on a napkin. Same thing uh, in terms of investors like Spanx, Sarah Blakely, or even Amazon, Jeff Bezos. Like many, many investors, especially experts in book publishing, turned it down. This one, you know, one of the first female self-made billionaires, like in a fraction of one generation. Yeah. So I leave you with this, three simple steps. Commit first, and anyone you talk to, ask them, are you ready? Get them to commit even when they don't know all your details. If you got them at yes to start with, chances are you've got them yes along the entire journey. Collaborate, don't be afraid, don't be a loner. Like really get out there, collaborate, and then crush it. Thank you. There's so yeah. many great lessons. Each one of your slides could be a, a course. course. <laughs> it could be a course in and of yeah. itself. Any questions from Mukesh? I'm on LinkedIn, so please connect. But don't just press the connection button. Like that's the easy way. <laughs> Write something. Tell me something about you. Write something to me. Or figure out a way how to connect with, with some written form. I have a yes. Question. Yeah. Maybe and your name? My name is Bajanda. Um, you mentioned that timing is very important. But on the other hand, you mentioned about uh, finding founders not from, for example, here. In the not exclusively from your comfort zone. Yes. Like, look out there. Timing is important. So by the time that you want to find a really good founder from another spot in the or like globally, you are losing your time. How you manage that? Well, you can find maybe one person that's within your network, but then after that, start asking people like who do they know and who do they know? And you have to build your network pretty quickly. Before we find the founders, we need the connection. Yes. Networking. So like uh, I teach a whole course on strategic power networking. And it's amazing to me like how difficult people find networking. Um, so here's a challenge. You want an exercise? If, if you're trying to build a network and don't quite have one that you're super happy with, give yourself this challenge. You have to meet 100 new people in the next 100 days. That's it, as simple as that. And you track everyone's names and kind of a little bit about them and who they know and like who introduced you to whom track it on like some massive Excel spreadsheet or whatever software you want to use or paper or notebook, but 100 people in 100 days. That should be like your minimum target. If you can do that, you're, you're going to build that network pretty quickly. And where, like I said, everywhere. Elevators. Anytime you're waiting for something and there's people around you, start talking to them. Right? It's one way. And then at, find out who the power connectors are and get them. There's a great book that someone in New Jersey He's like a Yale MIT grad, ex-McKinsey, built six companies, now teaches in academia. 
He's like, I think in his late, mid to late 60s, perhaps. Um, his name is Jack Killian. He wrote a book called Network. It's a red cover with white letters. Anywhere, everywhere, all the time. Great book. It'll give you lots of inspirational and uh, like actual tactics on how to build a network pretty quickly. So that could help as well. Right? <coughs> Leverage your contacts. Very important. Yes? Yeah, there's a statistics in the beginning. 150 startups, 45 IPOs, 30%. Yeah. Some may still be in the thing. What, what is the, the, the biggest shortcut of those that didn't move into the IPOs? Well, that did not like, yeah. have an exit? Yeah, why, why only 30%? Oh. You know, well, even those numbers are amazing. I know that. I know that. But, but I'm looking, yeah, I mean, we talk about success, but what are they? So I think it's the same five reasons. Like um, the team, the co-founders kind of fell through, and, and they lost the passion or couldn't work together, and so egos. What are you saying? There's no, no one thing that stands out. It could be. Not like, that I've read from them yet, okay. although I'll try to reach out to them and see if like they've done a reciprocal study to see how those criteria kind of lay out, because yeah. it might be in a different order. Yeah. Uh, most likely it is. And so, yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, that, that I can reach out to. Any, any thoughts on customer-funded models? Like if you're, let's say, you've kind of first on one market. And yeah, and you found somebody who's willing to fund it? Pop potentially, and okay. you haven't yet got uh, okay. investment funded. Okay. Sure. So customer strategic partnership with funding is not a bad thing, but just make sure you've done your diligence because if it's the wrong customer and they're funding and they're, they have a vote, like try to avoid that. Like keep yourself independently run and managed from a voting kind of diligence perspective. Uh, sorry, voting in an operational perspective so that they don't hold you hostage as your first customer. And try not to fall into the trap of being their outsourced developer, product developer. That's not your intention. Like, you don't want to just keep asking them, oh, what, what else do you want? What else do you want? And they just basically are designing their thing so customized to them that your ability to then scale that independent of them, like no one wants that. Only they wanted it. So be careful of that. But if you don't have any other sources of funding and you've tried, then that could be a good potential source. But they're paying for the project up front, or at yeah. least half of it yeah, up front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get an advanced deposit. Yeah. yeah, get some advanced deposit and some sort of payments on milestones, do not wait till you've delivered them the product for the payment. Stage it. Because like, you don't know who's going to get fired in that company and who's going to be in charge by the time you deliver the product. They can change their mind. So it's OK to ask up front for like Absolutely. percentage. Absolutely. Percentage, yep. Like net 90 or whatever. Yeah, no, ask for something up front and then stage the rest in installments as well. Maybe you put milestones in there or not. As you uh, pointed out, the critical point of the advisory board and board of directors, I would assume with the tremendous expansion of uh, entrepreneurship and company start, that that pool uh, may be getting thinner and thinner. I mean, people are really stressed out. Are there any particular, uh, are you seeing that? Finding not yet. That? Not yet. I still, yeah, because I think that community is also growing. Okay. As entrepreneurs get successful and have an exit, they basically then play the role of, sitting on the board of somebody else, like paying it forward. So there is this pipeline that's helping to keep it healthy <coughs> for now. Interesting. Yeah. And look, you got to be creative, right? Like we talked about creativity. Um, like I, I run a whole course on creativity, like how, you know, everything from the neuroscience of creativity to the business of creativity. If you can't get in touch with someone, like most people just stop. If you haven't sent seven forms of communication, one every several weeks, including all your prior communications in a thread so they can see how persistent and tenacious you are, until you hit number seven, you can't say you've tried. After you hit number seven, what do you do? Go to 12. <laughs> yeah, but okay, apart from that, that's great, I love that. What else can you do? Show up at their place of business. Just show up. I have found it to be amazing, and so many people I know who've hit it out of the park sometimes don't get the meeting, and they just show up. They show up with a case of beer and be like, look, this is for your team. 
You don't have to give me a meeting. All I'm asking is five minutes. Would you give me five minutes? Here it is. This, this is yours regardless. Or show up with pizza. Like, show up with something. And like, I just need five minutes of your time. Chances are they'll be so impressed that they'll say, OK, keep in touch. And let's set up another call. And then you can develop that. It's for a sale. No, no, this is for like any purpose that you need to connect with someone, whether it's co-founder, employee, executive, advisor, exit, buyer, customer, like so whatever it is. is not professional, is it? Does it matter? It is absolutely professional. If you show up at my office or in my classroom and say, listen, I tried to reach you. you maybe it went into your spam. We didn't get a chance to connect. I drove you know, an hour, two hours, just to see if I can have five minutes of your time. I'm thinking that's a person I would invest in. Yes, but that doesn't work in America's corporate, does that? We're in corporate? Yes. yes, it does. It works everywhere. There's a human need for people to connect with others. Timing may not be right. So you're just, you're, you're shortcutting some of the challenges. You're making it so easy for them that you can say, listen, and if t right now or today is not a good time, can you just give me five minutes on a call? Like, and chances are they're not going to say no. Now, some may, but then you just try again a year later, right? Like you just don't give up. I have met like the most amazing people and my mentors like include some people that I never thought would be possible had I not like been creative in my persistence, the creative persistence. Like the new CEO of American Express globally is one of my mentors, right? The former CIO of Merrill Lynch, mentor, former CEO of, uh, some of the big public pharma companies, mentors. I wouldn't have had those connections, but like, if you're persistent, you can get there. Don't, don't say most of them have a gatekeeper or something. You've got to some do, there. some don't. Oh, the other thing you can do, find out where they're giving a talk, go attend that. So for many years, I've studied GE, and I was like Jack Welsh, right? Like the brand of one of the best CEOs in the history of corporate America. You look at, the growth of the company during his tenure, phenomenal. 4,000% increase in valuation. How am I going to meet Jack Welsh? I don't know anybody who even knows him remotely, et cetera. So I found out that he was giving a keynote at the hospitality conference in Charlotte, North Carolina. I get a bunch of friends together. We drive in the car that same night, attend the conference. And then after he gives his keynote, the first thing I do is I walk out of the center and I hang out backstage somewhere, like in the hotel that leads to backstage. So when the door opens, you never know what can happen. And this is a risk, right? But I met so many people while I was there anyway, so it's worth it. So while I'm standing there, some guy comes out, and he's like a security guard kind of person. And he says, who are you? Who are you? Can I help you? <laughs> and he says, so I delay in responding, you know, pretend I'm responding to someone on the phone or whatever just to give him a chance to say something else. And he goes, are you on the list? My answer is, yeah, I'm on the list. <laughs> I have no idea what he means by that. And so he goes, oh. Um, and then I just say, by the way, I happened to step out in the conference for a little bit, so I miss, may have missed some of the information. Can you just give me some more details? And he goes, well, Jack Welsh said that he's willing to meet 30 people, and we're at 29. I don't, what's your name? And I said, it, well, it's not on there. And he goes, you know what? There's a spot here. He put me on. And I got like a two-hour one-on-one interview with Jack Welsh, like literally in a small group, half the size of this room. Like amazing, picking his brain. And then same thing with like Ariana Huffington from Huffington Post. In fact, with her, you got to be creative. Put out a question or a statement that's so intriguing that while that person does whatever they're about to do, they're still thinking about what you said. So with her, I said something. Um, she goes on stage, does her keynote at the conference. And in the keynote, she says, someone asked me this, and it got me thinking. And he's in the audience. And whoever you are, I want to meet with you afterwards. So afterwards, we met. And she's like, here, call me anytime if you need anything or if you want me to you know, kick ideas or whatever it is, write for Huffington Post, et cetera. I never took her on that because that wasn't my intention. But like, ask an intriguing question. You never know where it leads.
Like that, that works really effectively. A creative, intriguing question. Like what would cause someone to like think twice about you and what you said and why you said it and et cetera. So tell us the story when you did something like that and they carted you out. <laughs> no, it's it's they're all always, success stories? They're all success stories. <laughs> yeah. Smart I don't I've story. never had a failure yet on that. Okay. I'm waiting for one yeah. so that I can learn from it. I'm, I'm and not, then, I'm not waiting for the I'm yeah. waiting for the shoot. No, no, no. They're they're all pretty crazy stories. That's cool. Yeah, crazy stories. The the equity split you were talking about where yeah. I don't even do it. I know like Y Combinator is pretty big on like making sure it's even across and like they're one of the No, not necessarily. They're, they're also telling people, don't just pick the easy numbers, like okay. debate it. Now, if, if you go through a debate and you have all these notes and you pick even, show those notes to the, the investors and say, look, we didn't just do the easy thing. We actually debated this for two hours, ended up there, and there was no reason for us to change it just because, but like substantiate it. So Mukesh, yep. if anybody has questions, yep, I'll stick around, can for, a stick few around for a yes, few minutes. Sure. Thank you so very My much. Pleasure. It was so wonderful.